Good morning. Happy Dad's Day to all the fathers. I hope it's a good thank you. And uh, this morning we're actually concluding our series in the book of Hebrews. This is week number 14. Yeah, I know we started this a long time ago. And uh, it's been a, a journey to find out if we're heading in the right direction, why aren't things easier? Why do things become difficult? And so it's a real question that I think resonates with every culture and every generation. And so this book has been unpacked as we've gone along. And what we've discovered is that it's basically been written to insiders. So there's insider language and insider stories. And it makes it a very difficult book to read unless you know all of those references. So we've just been unpacking them as we go along, and I'd like us to conclude today by looking at the last portion of chapter 13. It says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact, I have written to you quite briefly, so I'm sure you're relieved because if you had written a longer letter, we'd only be halfway through it. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. And those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. Uh, almost any passage of scripture can be misunderstood, can be misapplied, can be misused. Uh, there are certain kind of rules of engagement to make sure that what you're drawing out of scripture is what was originally intended and meant. meant. Uh, there are some passages that seem to be more susceptible to misunderstanding and uh, misuse. And the beginning of the passage we looked at today is one of those passages, and it has to do with leadership. And it just talks about, you know, have confidence in your leaders, submit to their authority. And it just sounds like, you know, for some people, that's the only verse on leadership they know in the entire Bible. And so they use it not to exercise authority, but to exercise authoritarianism, which is quite a different thing. And so uh, we're going to look at this passage today just to see what is it that Scripture means when it talks about leadership in God's kingdom. Is that just leadership like we see in the rest of the world, only we put a cross on it? Or is there a lot more going on than that? And so we're, we're going to take a look at that. The first thing I want you to see, there's actually clues in this passage today. Leaders are to look out for others, not look out for themselves. This is where it starts. You look out for others, you're not looking out for yourself. Oh. The, the concept here is that they, are, they keep watch. That's a really interesting term. And it gets referred to usually in one of two areas if you, if you come from the perspective of a biblical culture. Uh, the first is a military. If you're keeping watch in the military, you're stationed on a wall or on a perimeter of some kind of military exercise and, and you have a response. By the way, not the highest ranking people keep watch. It's usually the lower ranking people. It's not something they signed up for. It's something that was assigned to them. It's not fun. It's boring it's, and, and potentially dangerous. This is not anything anybody wants. And so it would be easy to assume that this is a, a military term. But actually, there's a clue later on about what this is because it refers to Jesus as that, that great shepherd of the sheep. And so there are shepherds who keep watch over their flock. 
And this is kind of the perspective that's being applied to this passage. And it's a really important uh, perspective. And what is happening is, is the author of Hebrews is making a connection between the leaders and how they lead to our leader, the ultimate leader, the great shepherd, and how he led. And so the Bible gives us some really important insight on this. So what do shepherds look for when they're keeping watch? They look for predators. The reason they look for predators is because sheep are easy prey. Like I, I'm a little confused as to how they evolved to, to begin with. Like wh how did they survive this long? It really is an interesting thing. They have no natural defense mechanisms. They, they can't shoot poison. They don't have incisor teeth. They don't have razor sharp hooves. They're slow. They don't have a great sense of direction. Uh, their sense of smell is actually better than their sense of sight. Uh, really interesting group of people. How do, how do, we, get, how do we get sheep? And uh, you have to look for predators because it's like going into a food court at a mall. You know, you just, you just pick the one you want. And so a shepherd has to keep watch on the horizon because there are animals who will come in and try to take at least one sheep or destroy an entire flock. Uh, this is what Jesus said in, in John chapter 10. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is a really important thing. And let me tell you why. Sometimes, have, have you ever done this? Have you ever been a parent and your kid was doing something that put them at risk, themselves at risk? How many have ever noticed that along with the bevy of emotions you are experiencing, one of them is anger? And so it just comes out really hot and loud at the kid and you let them know, you know, am I, that only happened to me? <laughs> it did and you're laughing at me and there we go. So, but, so here's the thing. It is easy when you see the dangers of things that can happen in our world that what you wind up do is just yelling at and striking sheep. And this is not a good strategy because when you yell at sheep and you strike them, they scatter. And when they scatter, they're more vulnerable than they were before. You don't drive sheep. You lead sheep. And Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. They know my voice and they follow me. A predator needs to be struck. But we need to think about, of course you're going to experience all those emotions, but we, we need to learn to manage those emotions well. They, they also look for sheep that wander off. Sheep have, they're easily distracted. Um, you know, if this lump of grass tastes really good, they just keep going in, in that direction. And it's easy for them to disengage and kind of get out of sight. And so a, a shepherd has to be aware that the, the sheep could wander off. And, and the, this is what it says in John 10, uh, verse 11. It says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Notice, it's, it doesn't just say he puts his life at risk for the sheep. You know, going and, and, and tracking down a little lamb is, is not the most adventurous or exciting thing you can do, and it's probably frustrating at times, especially when it happens over and over again. And yet... Laying down of life is not just risking. It's not just standing up to the bear, the lion, or the wolf. Sometimes it's going after this lamb who's wandered off. And then it also tells us that leaders will be held accountable for their leadership. So this is interesting. Your leaders have confidence in your leaders because they keep watch over you as one who gives an account. That's the phrase that's used, right? As one who gives an account. This is a kind of a, a challenging thing when you step into leadership responsibilities in God's kingdom. Uh, you become aware that, that the stakes become important, but so do the standards. Like this is a real thing. In fact, James put it this way in chapter 3. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that those who teach will be, what's the next word? Judge. Judge. What's the next word? More. What's the last word? Strictly. Judge more strictly. Like, by signing up for leadership in God's kingdom, you are going to be judged more strictly. So why is that? And that is because the stakes are that high. And you're not just judged for what you do. 
but you're judged for how you do it. I can use truth in horribly abusive ways. And I can make my dying argument that I was just telling the truth. But we've all been on the receiving end of truth that felt more like a beating than a rescue, haven't we? And, and so God holds us to these standards. By the way, another thing that the shepherds look for, they, they look for some, some food supply. Healthy sheep eat, and healthy sheep eat a lot. In fact, healthy sheep eat hours every day. And some of you are going, it sounds like a good life to me. You know, just we'll go with that. But the thing is, is that sheep will just, they'll, they'll, they'll decimate the current food source. And you have to keep look, kind of looking out where there can be more food for them. And you have to keep moving into pastures. You have to keep looking, looking for predators, looking for wanderers, looking for more nutritional options. And if you don't do that, or how you do that, is actually assessed and evaluated by God. So we're accountable to leaders, held accountable for what we do and for how we do it. So what is a biblical leader? Like, how do we approach this? Because there's a lot of people who get worried, you know, well then... Why bother? The standards are high, the stakes are great, and it seems like we don't have a lot of options available. So, so what does a biblical leader look like? And I think that biblical leaders invite. They, they create doors of opportunity. God does this with us. Just look at the life of Jesus. He constantly invites people to follow him, invites people to listen to him, invites people to follow through on something that he offers to them. But you never see Jesus listing ultimatums. You either do this or that. We are so used to ultimatums that if somebody doesn't give us one, we'll ask for it. I'm not making that up. Someone will come to you and they say, well, you better do that. And we'll say, or what? Like, I want to know what's the price that I'm going to have to pay. It's it's built into our culture. It's embedded into our psyche. It's how we think. And it really hurts us in just about every relationship in life. But biblical leaders are called to invite. Biblical leaders are called to persuade. In our culture right now, the church often acts like it's at war with the world. And that's not what God calls us to. It is absolutely amazing to me how many people feel like it's a fight that we're in rather than it's an opportunity to invite and persuade. Now, don't even look like you've ever heard this before, and I'm not really picking on anybody, but it's Father's Day. And so I got a little attitude here. And so have you ever heard anyone say this, okay, especially when something was happening that they didn't like? And they'll say, this country was founded on Christian principles. What are they telling you? They're, they're telling you that because this country was founded on Christian principles and because there's an, an example of us drifting from that, then our culture needs to recalibrate to its origins. But I've been around a long time, longer than I care to admit, and I've never heard anyone one time in my life go, oh, I didn't know that. Well, then I'll change. <laughs> they don't do that. The church is founded on the rock Christ Jesus, and it was birthed into a culture that was hostile toward it and persecuted it at every chance it got, and it thrived because it didn't assume it had a right to control anything. They just wanted an opportunity to explain what God was doing in their lives, and it changed their lives and the world. We keep entering into a fight when we could be making a case. Does that make sense? Um, so... The challenge is, of course, is that history is filled with people who have overplayed the leadership card, and not just in secular and political things, and history books are filled with those examples, but in religious world as well. And I think that what's helpful to think of in spiritual environments is that it's not our job to control the outcome of a thing, it's our job to control our input into it. And then trust God for the rest. Does that make sense? 
So I'm really not the least bit interested in controlling your life. I have found it sufficiently challenging enough just to try to control my own. And so I, I, I will provide counsel, I will provide insight, I will provide prayer, I will, might even challenge a way that you're thinking or an approach that you're taking, but at the end of the day, the responsibility is always going to be yours to make your decision. Because the minute I get into the I have to control the outcome, then all my rules change and all my responses get harsh and the outcome actually might look good, but it really isn't. So it's just a, a way of thinking about this. Biblical leaders also earn trust. The, the goal here is not to demand trust, you know, uh, because uh, I've been uh, the lead pastor of Calvary Assembly, therefore you must trust me. You, you, you don't, I don't ever demand trust. I don't think that's wise. I try to earn trust. Watch me, watch my life, watch my heart, watch how I handle it when I make a mistake, watch how I treat other people, watch, watch how I take care of the things that have been entrusted to my care. And if over time you don't have trust in me, then my demanding it is not going to fix that. Does that make sense? I just think that this is a healthier way, and, and this is what Jesus does, right? He would just tell people, you've seen my life. You've heard my words. You decide what you want to do with this. It's such a powerful and, and, and compelling way to think about how we lead in our world. So uh, the challenge is, of course, is that in leadership circles, we can become very fearful. We're afraid that if we don't use all the techniques of the world, that we won't accomplish our goals. If we don't intimidate, if we don't manipulate, if we don't demand, if we don't command, if we don't kind of build up enough steam and, and run things over that somehow it won't work. But we've seen examples of this recently right, in, in our own church family. And by the way, we're not the exception to the rule. This is how God's kingdom actually works. So we had an opportunity. We, we knew one of our missionaries could buy five acres of land in Ecuador and that they were wanting to build a leadership training center and a seminary because they're already engaged and involved in over 200 villages around that area and there's hundreds more. They just need leaders and if they could just train leaders. And so, so I heard about that. I went and talked with our church council. I just said, this is a thing that's possible do you think that we could partner with this in any way? And, and we talked about it, and we prayed about it, and we decided this sounds like something God might want to uh, help us with. And so then I went and I talked to the missionary. We, we uh, recorded a video interview, and then I brought it to the church family, and I just said, no pressure. This is an opportunity. And, and I told you at that time, by the way, at the timing of this, it would be very easy to say, we really need all the money we, that comes in just for our project but I don't think we're here just for us. So if you feel God prompting you and you want to help with this project, then you can contribute towards it and everything you contribute will go to them. If they get more, even better. Our goal is $5,000. We sent a check for $13,553. <laughs> Isn't that great? I think that's fantastic. Oh, but pastor, if you don't intimidate, if you don't manipulate, if you don't demand, if you don't play the guilt card, it won't work. That's, that's actually not true. Not in God's kingdom. Um, Jonathan and, and Sarah, uh, Sigmund, six years ago, go on a short-term missions trip to a home that precious little girls are being rescued from a life that is beyond our description. I, I can't, my imagination can't even go there. And, and they're, they're not just kept safe for hours or days, they're raised and they're fed and they're educated and they'll even take care of college. It's amazing. And so Jonathan and Sarah come back and said, can we partner with them? And so we started talking, we started praying, we brought in counsel, we talked to our elders, we brought it to our church family. They put together a, a 5K race and, and, and every year now for five years, over $10,000, every single year has been contributed out of that towards Aki's place. This last year, over $14,000 just contributed out. Isn't that amazing? Let's just thank God for that.
It doesn't take someone standing at the front of the room, intimidating and, and manipulating. It, it doesn't take that. Everything in the kingdom of God operates a different way. There's invitation, and we just make the case, and, and then you get to decide. And what you decide that God is asking you to do, when we all do it together, it's amazing. Our church family, I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of services where we're out of seats. We're at or past capacity. And, and so we started a conversation two years ago about what, is, what was God asking us to do next? Because we're convinced that there's always a next with God. So what does that look like? So we, we talk to our council. We talk to our elders. And, and we begin to fast. And we begin to pray. And, and then we talk to people who have a lot of knowledge about things like this. And what are options? And what should we pay attention to? And what's the strategy? And how is this time to all those things? Then we started conversations with our church family. And, and it wasn't just, a, here's the, the thing, get on board. It was, this is our opportunity. Do you think we should do this together? And the answer was a resounding yes. And, and then we had conversations, groups of almost every size, sharing information, trying to respond to questions. And then came the moment when we were going to decide if we were going to not just say, I think it's a good idea, but I think we should do this. And that meant actually making commitments for 36 months, 36 months. And that moment came, and this church family stood up and said, yes, we are interested in doing that. And we met our goal of over $1.1 million that were pledged to this project. And money has been coming in faithfully, and I'm so grateful for that. And I don't think you have to do that through intimidation and manipulation and making people feel guilty. I just think that if, if we look to the example of the great shepherd, that there's no end of people who want to follow what he is doing, not just in their life, but in our world. Does that make sense? And so I just think that's a really big deal. So we actually don't have to use all the techniques that the world uh, kind of depends on. Biblical leaders also protect that not everyone has a wonderful agenda. Not everyone is well-intended. There are some people who will want to come in and access this resources that don't belong to them, or to gain a platform that they didn't build, or to try to get something that is based on their preference. And, and I wish I could tell you that never happens around here, but it does. I, know. I, I had a person invite me out for lunch one day, and uh, they said, I'd be happy to buy your lunch. I said, okay, I'd be happy to eat it. And we get together, <laughs> we go out, and we sat down, and, and this is how the conversation started. Pastor, last week, I gave this much in the offering. And it, it was a good number. And I said, well, that's, that's very generous. Thank you. And then the next sentence is, here is something I don't like about this church, and I would like to see it change. And I'm just sitting there going, what am I supposed to do with this? Is that really how the church is supposed to be run? By the biggest bidder. Is that what we do? If you can write a check for one dollar more than somebody else, you get what you want. I mean, is that healthy? Is, is that how we're supposed to live? And those conversations, they're wearying. They will wear you out. It's fatiguing. And yet, I think what God has called us to be and to do is worth protecting. And so you don't have to bite, you don't have to devour, but man, sometimes you do have to stand up and speak up. And that's how a, a place stays safe. That's how we stay on mission. These things are a really big deal. So as a result, the Bible says that, that when this example of leadership exists and this participation from people in a church family exists, the result is joy. Joy to the leaders. And, and, and so that's actually a good thing. And, and I hate this about myself. I really do. I don't like this. But I'm one of those guys that when I'm feeling really joyful, I tend to tear up. And that wasn't the kind of culture I was raised in, and I don't like that about myself. But I will tell you, there are times when people are so incredibly honest about what they're struggling with or where they've been hurt or wounded, and, and they dare to say it out loud because they're hoping something will change. And I can't tell you how much joy it brings to me, not what they're going through, but they actually think they're in a place where something could change about that. I think that's a really big deal. I really do. I love the generosity of this house. I love that we actually do believe that grace changes everything, and we actually do believe that something I have, God could use to make a difference in the life of someone he loves. I think that's a really big deal. 
I think that when, when we do these kinds of things together, it is a source of great joy. That's how the kingdom of God describes it. I love the hospitality that you have, that you actually warmly welcome people who come in here. Do you know what I've never heard anybody say? Nobody's ever come up and said this to me. Pastor, I came to the church that you pastor, and I was treated like dirt. I've never heard that. I'm so grateful. But you know something else I would never hear? I came to your church, and I was treated like dirt. I, I had to fight for a donut. I had to fight for a parking spot. I, I had to fight for a seat. It was a fight, fight, fight all day long. I barely got out of there alive, but your message changed my life. That, that. <laughs> if people don't feel welcomed by us, they will never believe that God welcomes them either. They just don't. And the way you guys scoot over and let somebody sit next to you, the, 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 way, you, the way you invite people, I, I'm so honored. Do, we actually have a thing that goes on here. It's the most amazing thing to me. Our highest level of visitors often come on holidays when family members and friends are getting together. And, and I was talking about this with our staff. I said, this is what it means. It means that our church family so loves this place that when they have family members and friends that get together for holidays, instead of staying home, they just want their family and friends to see this place. And I just, I'm blown away by that. What does that mean? It means two things. It means you get why we're here. We're not just here for us. We're here for a mission to make sure everybody gets a chance to taste grace for themselves. And secondly, it means that this place feels safe enough to you that you know if they come, they're going to be exposed to truth and grace, but it's not going to be done in a way that drives them away. I think that's such a cool thing. And that's a source of great joy uh, to me in my life. So grace has a way of opening our lives, not only to what we reveal about ourselves, but what we will hear from others about ourselves. And this is my last point this morning. Humility is the belief that God can use others to help me grow. That I have blind spots. I have blind spots. There are things I don't see about myself. And... Others see them, and they can speak into my life, and that's a gift. I have strengths I don't recognize, and others can see them and speak into my life, and that's a gift. In our hyper-independent culture, it's very easy to think, I don't need anybody. I'll figure it out all by myself, and Hebrews comes crashing into our lives and says, it's not true. We need the investment of others. They'll see things we don't see, and they'll say things we wouldn't say. And the result is we become closer to what God intends for our lives. Let's bow our heads this morning. I would be really... Um, uncomfortable if your parting thought from walking, listening to this today is well they just get it all right here uh, we're not a perfect church and I am not a perfect pastor I really am not it isn't about whether we think we're perfect it's about what model we're looking to to make a difference in our world and what we've decided as a church family is that intimidating and manipulating and demeaning, you might get some compliance, but you don't get transformed lives. You just get people who are afraid. And I don't think that grace and fear are compatible in the same space. I think that when we lean into fear, grace gets kind of rare. And when we lean into grace, fear begins to subside. And so I think we don't have enough places of grace in our world. I think that we've got more than enough places of fear. Wouldn't it be great if we could just keep 
keep grace flowing like a river until our hearts are saturated in everything God intends. That's what we ask for today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?